thank you for the board of the uh, Leah University Friends, Library Friends, uh, very, very active supporting this uh, event as well. Uh, and uh, this one in particular uh, is also co-sponsored by the Leah University English Department, the Africana Studies Program, and the Creative Writing Program. Uh, so as you know, we're trying to do uh, as many programs as we can in partnerships with others, uh, and uh, to make sure that many perspectives and many voices are heard and respected in our libraries. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'm gonna be presenting uh, or introducing now Bob Watts. Uh, and he is our, uh, a creative writing MA from North Carolina State University and a creative writing PhD in English from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, his first collection of poems, Past Providence, won the 2004 Stanzas Prize from David Robert Books. And his work has been published in poetry the Paris Review, Great River Review, and the Redivider, among other journals. Professor Watts teaches in Lehigh's creative writing program and is the advisor of Amarnath, Lehigh's premier student library journal. So thank you very much, uh, Bob, for uh, facilitating the, the uh, discussion today. I absolutely knew I'd forget to unmute. Thank you, Boaz. And it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Ramika Bingham Risher, who is a poet, interviewer, essayist, a Cave Canem Fellow, an Afro-Latin poet. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the Writer's Chronicle, New Letters, Callaloo, and Essence, among many other journals. She's the author of four collections of poetry, Conversion, which was the winner of the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award, What We Ask of Flesh, such a, such a nice title from Etruscan, uh, shortlisted for the Houston, uh, Hurston Wright Award, Starlight in Error, which was winner of the Diode Editions Book Award, and most recently, her new collection just came out this year, Room Swept Home. Um, her first book of prose, I think something of a memoir, Soul Culture, Black Poets, Books, and Questions That Grew Me Up, was published by Beacon Press in 2022. She's currently the Director of Quality Enhancement Plan Initiatives at Old Dominion University and resides in Norfolk, Virginia with her husband and children. Uh, I believe today she's going to be reading from her work, her poetry, and uh, her prose as well, and discussing kind of personal archives, how, how uh, particularly um, people that are often, or groups that are sometimes left out of the the primary archive, create their own, how we all create our archives. I'd like to, uh, to close the introduction with a couple of lines from her poem, Interrogation Suite, Where Did You Come From? How Did You Arrive? In which she writes, I entered the world a turning storm, but no one stopped me, though they'd been warned. So consider yourself warned, and please welcome Ramika Bingham Risher. Oh man, Bob, that's that's the setup. Now I gotta be fierce on here. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. You know, Heather and Boaz are like super shy. They're off camera. Um, but really, I thank you so much. I thank Lehigh. This is um less conventional than you would imagine a, a university doing national poetry month events and actually seeking out contemporary poets. So I thank you so much for that. And particularly to Heather. Um, librarian extraordinaire who reached out about my memoir, Soul Culture. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from that um, at, at Heather's suggestion. Um, but she happened to reach out on the day that my <laughs> next book of poems had come out, Room Swept Home. So I said, Heather, I would love to come and speak, but I got this new book that you might be interested in as well. So um, you all were kind enough to kind of let me think about those books in conjunction with each other. Um, and I hadn't had the opportunity to do that yet. So that's what we're going to talk about for a little while, please. You know, I, I can see the chat just like everybody else can see the chat. Um, so feel free to jump in um, with questions or with comments. And then Bob and I will talk and facilitate those questions at the end. Um, and I've got some notes for myself, so don't think I'm a crazy person. I'm looking over at some of the notes and we'll talk through some of the things that that got us here. In particular, you know, 
what's left out of the archive? Um, this is a question that I've been thinking about um, quite a bit in the last 10 years. And I think maybe I'll just start with a little preface um, from each of these books about why that fascination um, has come back to me and why poetry has been um, a kind of genealogy for me. Um, genealogy, of course, meaning a, a way to trace your ancestry um, or study your family history. And I've done some of that work too, very specifically, and we'll talk about that in Room Swept Home. But I've also traced my path uh, in the family of poets. Um, and that is kind of what this memoir, um, Soul Culture, is about. So by way of introduction, um, Soul Culture came to be because for years I was interviewing Black poets that I really loved, like Lucille Clifton and Natasha Trethewey and Avan Jordan. There were 10 of them, and I was doing these comprehensive interviews over 10 or 15 years. Um, and kind of publishing those interviews. And I always thought, boy, this body of knowledge needs to be somewhere. Um, and when I decided to put them together and put together a, a book of nonfiction, I found a, a wonderful agent. Uh, and my agent said, your voice is fantastic. These essays that are kind of in between the interviews that, that are kind of linking them together and thinking about craft, you know, they've caught my interest and we can't sell interviews. So you need to rewrite this whole book. Yee, if we have any writers out there, you know, that's kind of a scary conversation to start. But that was really the spark that had me think about my personal archive, um, because I was kind of shocked that anyone was interested in what I had to say. Why would someone be interested in a memoir from me at this point? And she said, because you have taken all of this knowledge from these poets and you've made a life for yourself. So let's talk about how that's done. Um, so that's what's happening in the memoir and in Room Swept Home, um, the very recent book of poems, um, kind of taking this idea of a personal archive and moving it kind of leaps and bounds further because I'm digging back into the lives of two of my grandmothers and kind of tracing their path all the way up through my own existence. So let's just read a little bit um, from each of these. I'm gonna bounce back and forth between the two. Um, and hopefully you, you, can, you can grab them at the library. Um, if you don't have them yourself, please, 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 nothing would um, you know, make me happier than, than uh, seeing you guys check out books. Um, and so something that I talk about in, in one of the essays in soul culture is how silence is a kind of destruction. And destruction is what we've inherited and keep trying to disinherit. Uh, that was something that I thought about a lot as a black poet. Um, and that's because often what happens um, in history uh, for black folks in this country is steeped in trauma. Um, and it's often things that people are trying to forget. And as a poet, the things that other folks are trying to forget, I'm often trying to find ways to remember. So here's just a little bit from um, the opening essay of Room Swept Home that goes back to that idea that silence is a kind of destruction and I wanna rail against that. In July, 2017, my husband and I take our children to the new National Museum of African-American History and Culture in Washington, DC. It's taken six months to get tickets and the lines outside and in are still wrapped around the structure, the makeshift ropes, the slavery and freedom 1400 to 1877 exhibits. This is a true story. What is left to say about slavery? A woman asks loudly her irritation palpable as we make our way in. Before the trip, I've begun working on a project about my grandmothers that's been swirling in my head for years. In a strange twist of kismet, my ancestors intersect in Petersburg, Virginia, 40 years before I'm born. My paternal great-great-great-grandmother, Minnie Lee Folks, lived in Petersburg and was interviewed for the WPA Federal, Federal Writers Project, Ex-Slave Narratives. 
my maternal grandmother, Mary Edenite, after birthing her first child, is given a diagnosis of water on the brain. Um, postpartum was an ongoing mystery then. And she was sent to the Central Lunatic Asylum for the Colored Insane in Petersburg in 1941, a stone's throw about a mile from where Minnie resides. Well, I find that connection fascinating. Two disparate women of my history at opposite ends of their lives, converging upon space and time and ushering in the stretch strain of folks who will usher in me. Um, so as you can see, my ideas about myself and my history started changing over time as I was doing this work. Um, while I was interviewing those poets um, that would eventually kind of make up the, the backbone of soul culture, I was also trying to figure out the things that I would be writing about, um, the way that I would explore my own private history and also do that by linking in the historical archives, so really public history as well. Um, and it helped shift a lot of the things that I understood about my own story. Um, in Soul Culture, the essays open with me kind of telling the story of how I was a little Black girl. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and in many ways, I was just invisible in that landscape. I was in Phoenix before there was an MLK holiday. Um, and so it was really difficult for me to find poets even that, you know, looked like me. I had no idea um, until a fifth grade teacher brought in Langston Hughes, brought in Mother to Son, um, that there were, you know, an abundance of Black poets and contemporary Black poets. Honey, I didn't find those until college. Um, so this was a lot of um, extraordinary shifting for me over time. Um, and that story is, is continuing to be built. But one of the poets that I interviewed and that eventually you know, on any given day, if you ask me, you know, the three poets that I would recommend to everyone to read, Lucille Clifton is going to be one of those three poets on any given day of my life, um, because she kind of changed all that I understood about writing. Um, and so kind of by way of introducing some of the things that I continue to write about, I'm going to read a little section from um, the essay where I interview her as well. Um, and Lucille Clifton, if you if you don't know her work, please pick up her work. Um, you can find her everywhere. Um, but she was just kind of fearless. Um, it's something when you interview a person uh, and they are ready to tell you kind of everything about themselves uh, very candidly. Her poems were already doing that kind of candid work, but people had started thinking of Miss Lucille one who wrote lots of midrash, lots of biblical retellings, um, dealing with mythos in, in lots of ways, um, you know, that she delved into the extraordinary. When I read Lucille Clifton's book, Quilting, even more than her precision with poems, because she wields those things like a knife, I was taken with what Clifton chose to write about, the intimate body, Black existence, women's realities, godliness, the past and our legacies, people she pulled from obscurity. One of the most pertinent observations that came from our interview was an aphorism someone else, an avid reader, had used to describe her process. She said, Clifton said, someone once told me, you find the myth in the human and the human in the myth. Clifton made many question how flesh was linked to spirit, how the body was an extension of the divine, and why so many of us were extraordinary but left wanting. So that that kind of, you know, the kids would say, you know, that's my villain origin story. I don't think I'm a villain, but that's certainly part of my poetry origin story. Um, and so when I started writing about my grandmothers in Room Swept Home, it was because of those extraordinary instances. I was looking for the myth in the human and the human in the myth. Um, and my grandmother, Minnie, who I never met, my paternal great, great, great grandmother who passed away in 1945, um, but who my paternal grandmother, um, Shirley Bingham, hey, Nana, 
um, was born in her bed and knew her until she was five. And I could do lots of family research. Um, but we also had this really telling interview from many. If you've ever had a chance to read any of the WPA um, slave narratives, um, you'll find that some of them are very stilted. Um, you can imagine with this project that there were lots of reservations from the folks that were involved in it um, because at that time, people were kind of in their 70s and 80s who had been enslaved and the U U.S. government realized, listen, if we don't capture some of these stories, boy, you know, these folks are all going to be gone. Uh, and so that's what they set out to do, which was an admirable project. And I'm so grateful it happened. But many of the writers who were involved in the project were white writers and they went out to black folks' homes and they said, so how was your time in slavery? And black folks said, oh, hey, it was all right. <laughs> you know, because they were worried about disclosing, you know, um, many of the difficulties that came with, you know, uh, living on plantations and uh, violence that ensued at every turn. But Minnie's interview is very different. Uh, my grandmother's interview is very different because she was interviewed by a dear friend, Susie R.C. Bird, who was a Black woman educator who lived in the area. Um, and her daughter was interviewed a few, late, few years later for a different project. So that makes me believe they were friends. Um, so Minnie kind of tells it like it is in this interview, um, which you can read almost anywhere. You can Google it. Um, and so I was interested to to read and kind of reframe some of that voice of hers um, and give her space to tell her own story. So this poem is in Minnie's voice. Uh, the title is taken from her actual WPA narrative, April When the War Surrendered, um, because uh, many, many of the enslaved weren't quite sure um, after the end of the Civil War or when emancipation um, was actually enacted on their plantations. Um, but this is a, a joy poem about that moment in Minnie's voice. April, when the war surrendered. But we didn't know till May, cause Miss Godsey ain't said a word. But after, we stomped and cried and made freedom songs, joy in the hands, joy in the feet, even the quiet, a jubilee. Freedom sweeter than what any man say. We danced, made drums from 10 and carried on till Sunday, till someone asked where we was heading. A whole lot of folks took off for nowhere. Other folks went looking for children. Some, like me, were children, but had nothing, no one. Mama and I stayed on. Mama ain't like Mrs., but where would we go? That lady cried something awful, said she'd clothe us, give us cornmeal and lard. I worked her land and cooked, learned to tend the garden and count what little was ours. So, so much of, of what comes back in both soul culture and in room swept home um, is this idea of honoring the elders. Um, like I said, when I started thinking about this project, I didn't think those two books went together. And I mentioned that to my husband and he's cute, so I'll keep him. But he said, what do you mean? They're exactly the same. There, It's about honoring the elders. It's about tracing your path. It's about your history and public history. And I thought, oh my goodness, I had never thought about the ways that they kind of speak to each other. Um, but that's one of the ways that they speak to each other. They find the extraordinary in um, our history in the, in the States and, and how we can trace that back through our own past. So I'm gonna read a few more poems and pieces kind of back and forth, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. And so um, one of the things that I also tried to do in Soul Culture um, was go back to voices that I did not get to interview, but who really became um, a model for me in many ways. And one of those voices is Elizabeth Alexander, another fantastic poet that I hope you go and find. Um, she was Barack Obama's inaugural poet, so lots of people know her for that. Um, and in the essay about Sonia Sanchez, 
um, I'm thinking about the way their work uh, is kind of in tandem with each other. So in a, a documentary that was produced about Sonia Sanchez, when Sanchez is asked about whether her work is personal, she talks about the collective I in the way I think of it. She speaks for the communities of common folk. She's a listener and a medium. This duality reminds me of something I go back to in the revolutionary work of Elizabeth Alexander. She aligns with Sanchez's and Walker's theory that the artist must work for the people, but also be of them. Alexander's lifelong admonition is clear and has become the crux of my own work, no matter the book. Honor the elders' voices, honor your own. Alexander is a model for my work and life. I think of her as a woman bearing grace, power, and reinvention, co-mutual force and spirit, siren and beacon. Her revolution carries me. And so as I think about Elizabeth Alexander and her thinking that it's revolutionary to really write about the people that you live amongst, because um, I don't know how many poets and MFAers we have out there. I know Boaz, you're an MFA who's back in the libraries now. Um, but often we're told to not write our experiences, even some of the brilliant poets of our time, like Natasha Trethewey that I interviewed in Soul Culture, was told by her teacher in grad school that she needed to stop writing about, you know, her mother who had passed and stop writing about her blackness and that those things weren't poetic, not lyrical enough. And I think um, that's some crud. <laughs> you know, I teach my students to write from their experience and to expand it, right? Because there are so many ways that we make way for others in our living and make way for the revolutionary to enter our lives, particularly, you know, those of us who are marginalized in some way. Uh, but that living and that revolutionary living is often left out of the archives. Um, something that I tried to do a lot in Room Swept Home is I tried to think about all the types of poems I never got to see. Um, poems about women's friendships, uh, poems about women running their own businesses, um, you know, even at times like during the Great Depression when, you know, um, it was very difficult to do so, but women kind of kept communities afloat. Um, writing poems about domestic workers who are, are often thought of as, you know, kind of just the useless shadow when you're writing about um, the, the wealthy and prominent whose homes they kept and children they tended. Uh, homes they kept and children they tended for years. Um, but these are the folks who who kept most of us, generations of us afloat and survived, even when those extraordinary circumstances um, managed to make their way into their lives. Um, and such was the case with my other grandmother, with Mary Knight, um, who was sent to the Central Lunatic Asylum. Um, and was, you know, within one mile of many in 1941. Um, and so I'm going to read um, one of the poems about her time at the asylum. Um, she was only 18. Can you imagine being 18, um, being very newly married, uh, having a baby nine days ago, uh, being separated from your family and everyone you knew and, and sent to uh, kind of have this water and aversion therapy to kind of fix you, fix in quotes, right? Um, I can't imagine the fear that um, would, would hold on in that case. You know, maybe I can't imagine it because it was something she never spoke about again until the very end of her life. This wasn't something that was common knowledge to me. Um, Mary Knight and I uh, were dear friends up until the time that she passed um, in 2007. And so, and so, you know, these were things that I, I was, I knew her as kind of one of the strongest women I knew, but I didn't know how strong until I started digging into some of the historical archives um, and was actually able to read many of her um, documents that were kept by Central Lunatic Asylum, that's now Central State Hospital, still in existence, um, a very different facility. Um, but after 75 years, I was able to request 
um, her paperwork from her time there. And one of the things that the paperwork um, harkened back to was this water therapy um, that many of us kind of know now was something that was done um, when folks were put into uh, mental health institutions um, in, in the 30s and 40s. And it wasn't very useful, but particularly to a Black woman who was raising a bunch of children then during the civil rights era, I imagine that it would come back to her in many ways. So this is to calm the mind and it's in Mary's voice. More than 20 years from now, when my last child has been born, I'll remember the hoses while others despair at children on the news, treated like dogs, worse than being punished for having their own free minds. But all these years before, they use the water to quiet us. A hose can peel back skin or curdle it. Cold water begins to burn. Water in the bath that lasts for hours or days. Water sprayed hard as we are lined up against a wall until we pass out or shut our mouths. No one here can stand screaming. There is little singing. When we get music, they call it a diversion. Sometimes my ears are still filled with what's left. It's quiet, quiet now. I have to do something with my hands. We are given mops to clear the room. The water is like an ocean. Those calling like the drowned, gone to the never ending bottom. Maybe another door will open onto the sea if there are doors that can carry the sea and they will pass me by. Every floor can be the briny floor there or the well I feared all those years on the land my father farmed. A child fell inside once and many nights passed before anyone thought to look over its edge. So one of the things that I was trying to do, desperately trying to do in Room Swept Home, um, in addition uh, to kind of expose um, parts of our histories that aren't talked about and women who don't get to tell the full scope of their stories, um, is to try to highlight survival. And through that, um, you get a lot of trauma in the middle um, and to break some of that up. Um, I had to work to intersperse beauty throughout as well. Um, so in addition to that, there are, there's a lovely family tree. Um, there are gorgeous images of mothers and children and families caring for each other. And even some of my um, family history, some of my personal images um, end up there because I think often ruminating in beauty is what we forget while we're digging into the historical archive. Um, especially marginalized folks. So love as revolution, love as a grounding force was something I came back to um, as well. It was interesting to go back to soul culture and to think that these books had absolutely nothing to do with each other. Um, but when I went back to my introduction, which was written 10 years before this book ever existed or I was ever thinking about Mary's stay in the asylum, I was thinking about Mary and how her story might intersect with mine um, quite a bit because here's a paragraph from the introduction to soul culture that mentions her by name. Much of this work, my work overall, is woman heavy because my life and aesthetic is woman heavy. There are several overarching themes found in my work, but I am most intrigued by the way we as humans and especially women, but more especially women of color are asked to maneuver in such narrowly carved spaces. In editing this book, I realized that my maternal grandmother, Mary Knight, born in Scotland, North Carolina in 1922, appears on the periphery of many of the pieces. I was often consumed by her closeness and care before she died, 
just as I was planning the hows and whys of this project in my head. My grandmother had the same wiliness as so many of the ancestors remembered in this collection, and she still colors every part of my life. In many ways, this book, like all of my books, is for and because of women like her. So it's interesting to find these threads um, and some of these threads of your own archive and your own story, you'll miss until somebody asks you to go back to them. So I have Heather to thank for that. Um, and because my work is woman heavy and because I was writing from a place of um, love and insistence, I think that's why some of those things kept coming up in the book. Um, and so I'm gonna read a few love poems from Room Swept Home. And then I'll kind of close out with a with a personal piece about um, the same thing, love being revolutionary in our households from soul culture. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit from a crown of sonnets that happens in the book. So um, as I was writing about my grandmother's, I wasn't quite sure where um, in time these poems were going to end. And it turns out uh, they ended when I became a grandmother myself. But that's another story. Um, not really another story. If we read the book, you'll see the poem. <laughs> it's not really another story. But that's where it ends in time. But there's a crown of sonnets here that kind of asks so many of the questions I was asking while I was reckon, reckoning with their lives together. Um, and this is just one of those sonnets. So this is um, Sonnet 14. Um, it's also called the Lose Your Mother Crown uh, because it's based on a fabulous book by Sadia Hartman, who goes on her own personal journey um, into the history um, and archives. And so all of the poems in the crown start with quotes from her work. Nostalgia or regret could kill you in a place like America. Love brings you home, wears you out, makes you tired on the inside. You ask yourself who you might have been in another time. But in truth, in any America, no one would care for you like they should. You'd still be making your own joy every way you could, wearing velvet, singing loud, kissing the fat on a baby's thigh, feeding whoever's hungry. All the women before you, a tapestry you wish you'd held, lives you wish you'd seen. But they'd tell you, girl, you can't be with everything. The further you dig, the more it haunts you. Every life, a slow drag. They knew going back was like a wound opening. So love can be difficult. Um, the digging, if you're a writer out there, um, can sometimes be a hard part of the journey. Um, but love can be really joyful, um, jubilant even too. And so... Um, I'll read one more poem from this collection um, because one of the things that I found that's often left out of the archives is what kind of love sustained these folks that they went through such tough times. <laughs> you know, what were the things that kept them going? And I found um, that it was, you know, just toughness, <laughs> right? Uh, that was one of the things. But also, like I said, there were, deep friendships that carried these women long after their, you know, um, husbands had passed, but there was deep romantic love that you'll hear too. Um, in many ways, uh, there was love of children. Um, there was, uh, you know, love of feeding folks that comes back quite a bit. There was faith um, in many different ways and many manifestations. And so um, this is a piece kind of near the end of the book where I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just um, sitting with the trauma, but that I thought about some of those loves as well. I am trying to carve out a world where people are not the sum total of their disaster. But for the grace of God, 
one might begin. And this must be the life of a woman. I will barely touch the surface of all it took to keep them here. They taught us to nod to others in the street, to holler love, to knead eggs and butter and flour into yeast rolls larger than fists, to coax and heed the land. Looking at us, every god must be astonished and envious. What could leave us finished? Grandmother's grandmother enslaved by someone's daughter, enslaved and someone's daughter held her mother out to us with eager, capable hands. What couldn't she grow? What couldn't she stand? And the man beside her kissing her neck at night before being thrown into war in the nation and abroad barreled back to her, her creases, her starch and hand-me-down pots, her thick hair and threadbare dresses, loved every falling apart piece of her, down to the rocked over heels on her shoes. Every lie told says there was no love between them, but everywhere I turned, here it was. Slow drags, belly laughs, few reckon with their joy. Most will make happiness a footnote along with evenings on the porch, hitting the number straight or box, mother wit, inner light. Oh, glory and genius of unfathomable invention to raise over full children with a guiding soft hand. Strange how everything can become a symbol, a cushaw gourd, songs sung to trees, hair luster, dreams. Any charm one carries can be a hopeful, treasured thing. They helped us find bottles with corners of homespun shine and place our lips above the hollow until they sang. They were not angels. They were not myth. They saved pennies and baby hair and wedding rings, grew big as a piano box, broke through fever. Their suffering wasn't everything. So that's just a little bit about the love of my grandmothers. And I'm gonna end um, with a piece about the love in my house. I already called out my husband. Uh, this book kind of chronicles us getting married. And it was kind of add water, instant family. He had three kids that came along with us. So um, this is kind of a portrait in our house. Um, and this is kind of the brightest part of my archive right now. Our black joy is the house we build for the children, the house we tend for ourselves. Michael and I keep our friends close. We keep the music and dominoes and table smacking laughter closer, joy on joy on joy. We don't take each other for granted. We see God in our likeness in all we have and do. I sing him Michael Jackson's Got to Be There at our wedding. He reads me E.E. E. Cummings, I carry your heart with me, I carry it in. He lets me scatter books on the bed, then fall asleep. Some nights in my turning, I find him making bookmarks out of tissue or receipts so he can save the place I might have lost. Fewer and fewer nights now, he has the dream of his father and brothers whom he has to fight in his slumber. I put my arm on his shoulder to calm but not wake him, and he settles into softness, sleeping next to me. Joy is tending to each other, two-stepping in the hallway, oversized children crowding our bed to watch a movie they know I will fall asleep on and that they can quote word for word. It's going to see Fela and the Lion King and the trip to Bountiful on Broadway, escaping to the lights together, discovering some shining, binding, boundless new thing. Sure, there's too much laundry and most nights the world is burning, but we forgive the world for this as there are also brownie Sundays, poems scribbled in most margins 
and early morning ocean waves with the sun making paintings of the sky as we throw the football around. We pray so much we think God tires of us. We believe paradise is a real thing. We plan to make it together. Despite what ails and chases us, people see it on our faces. We are a blinding, dancing light. And all the while, I write. Thank you all. Ramika, thank you so much. That was just absolutely, absolutely lovely. Um, we have several questions and I think more coming in, but I wanted to... Um, wanted to ask a question actually have a have probably a couple of questions one I was I was so struck by a line from the first poem you read yeah. and then from the uh, uh, and how it went together with a line from the uh, the sonnet that from the crown of sonnets you okay in, in April when the war surrendered the I think it was the last line to count what little was ours yeah and then a line uh, I believe it was from the from the sonnet Mm -hmm. making your own joy and how, um, how much those two things go together how even yeah. when when there is so little that can be ours sometimes that we can we can make joy out of out of everything that's right well not out of um, everything, but, but and, and that's what folks did right yeah. <laughs> i mean these were folks who literally you know had nothing that poem you know after after the civil war you know what history tells us is you know, most of the people who were enslaved were in were displaced at that time. There were all these vagrancy laws put in place to kind of keep them still. So it was a scary time. Um, but what it seemed was happening with Minnie is her mother was teaching her to garden. She eventually becomes a gardener of her own and like sells wares at the market and is like able to keep her family afloat. And, you know, her mother and what I found from really delving into the historical record is her mother and grandmother uncle and father, she managed to keep all of these relationships intact um, and became a midwife because that was something her mother did as well. So they taught each other and loved and held fast to any of those bonds. And I think that's something we still do today. Yeah. Right. Even when we're broke, we make right. our own joy. You know, I want to, uh, to ask you a question, too, about uh, archive, about the sort of the idea of archive. I, I think when we when we think of archives, we tend to think of collections of physical things, you know, papers mm -hmm. and objects and, and things like that. Yeah. But uh, it strikes me, I, my grandfather, my father's father lived to be 104 Ooh. and kept his mind wow. until the end, outlived most of his children, unfortunately. So, mm. but he had so many stories. I mean, and mm. he would tell them over and over and over again. You yeah. hear the same stories yes. many, many times. So do you think of family stories? Are they part of the archive? It certainly absolutely. seems absolutely like. I mean absolutely you know um now there's the whole studies on ethnography and you know these kind of interviews uh, and that's what I had to do to find m many of the context much of the context for these stories right like the things that were actually written documents and, and people tend to think of archives as like things that maybe the government or you know your library might keep and and oh my goodness libraries were my saving grace during this this project for sure. Um, but, you know, I went back to the people who could actually give me the context. So I can maybe figure that you were living in 1941 and I know Susie Bird came to your house and she interviewed you. But what were you talking about that night when you all sat around and listened to the radio? You know, oh, they were making announcements about World War II. We didn't even think about, you know, the context that's happening in the middle of all this living. So family stories to me are a huge part of the archive. Much of, you know, what I think of as my archive isn't necessarily physical, um, as, as many of those things are. So I encourage other people, you know, um, I tell them to record those stories now because, you know, who knows how fortunate we'll be if our grandparents are around till 104. And I know they're telling you the same story 15 times, but write it down once. So when they're gone, you'll still have it as part of your archive. All right. Uh, so let me go to some of the questions uh, from the from the participants. And sure. I'll start with this question from um, Mary Nicholas, which came in you know, at the very, very early in your reading. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think we need a new WPA to interview 
you know, just ordinary people Ooh. now. It says forgetting is a kind of destruction too. Mary, I think that's such a fantastic question. I mean, you know, if it were up to me, now I'm a poet. So I want to record everything. I want all the stories written down. Um, I think, you know, that project came about in kind of the midst of the Federal Works Project. I mean, there were so many different things that were happening there. Also, public gardens being cared for and, and taking place at that time. They were looking for work for people who had lost work. And the artists, of course, had lost much work um, during the Depression. So this was kind of a way to dig the country out of a depression. Um, and since we're perpetually living in, you know, recessions <laughs> that kind of move and, and ebb and flow now, um, might, uh, you know, an artistic kind of ongoing WPA project be useful to us? I think yes, um, because I think there are so many stories that kind of just get lost in the shuffle of things. So for me, my answer would be absolutely yes, you know, collect everything that we can. But, you know, I will say that there are some things that I really enjoy that have kind of just become part of our narrative. Now, StoryCorps is a fantastic project that, you know, I hope if people are going back to those. And now StoryCorps has really expanded so that they're kind of regional um, StoryCorps. Sometimes StoryCorps will come to your space and you can record. So there's there there are other, you know, that's just one really great example of how we're collecting stories today. But I think there are many ways to do that. And I would love to see it happen again. I'm very glad to hear you mention StoryCorps. I've cursed yeah. them so many times for making me cry on the way to work. On listen, Friday. listen, I tell my husband, I can't ever hear Werewolf in London the same anymore. You guys <laughs> haven't heard that one? Oh, my God. No, I haven't, I haven't the heard that one. The daughter talking about her father. Oh, God, it's terrible and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, they, <laughs> wonderful. They, they are so many. Yes. Okay. Um, Elon Clark asks, does the poet have social responsibility? Um, and whether whether that whether you answer that yes or no, uh, who are you writing for and why? Oh, that's interesting. Um, does the poet have social responsibility? Uh <laughs> the answer for me as a poet writing while I'm sitting at my desk is no. Now don't freak out. Um, because I can't put the weight of social responsibility on myself. Or I might become didactic and try to start beating people over the head with something. Do poets have social responsibility whether they want it or not when the work is released into a reader's hands? Sure, of course. Um, because part of your living, you know, becomes political because you're a thinker, right? And if you're a thinker and you're also of a marginalized group and you're also of a group that, you know, is is living in, in the lower class and you're also of a nation that has, I mean, you know, there are all these layers to it. Um, but for sure, you know, I, I say all the time, um, and, you know, this is something that the Black folks have been arguing about forever. You know, Langston Hughes, a Negro artist in the racial mountain, you know, th this is this is something that, he was arguing forever, you know, am I, can I just be a poet? County Cullen wanted to just be a poet. And Langston Hughes says, you're a black poet. There, you know, there's no difference. People are going to see your blackness, whether you want them to or not. So when I'm writing poems about my grandmother, I'm for sure writing love poems about my grandmother, but see, people will see them as poems that also do the historical work of reclaiming the enslaved, right? Um, and so because of the way we live, I absolutely think that, you know, the poets, you know, uh, ha are going to be thought of as ones having social responsibility. Um, and your the second half of your question, who am I writing to? The real and true answer when I sit down to write is I'm writing to myself. Um, I don't really write poems to answer. I write poems to ask the questions and articulate questions as best I can. Um, and I get closer and closer to that over time. I hope I can ask questions better next month than I ask them this month. Um, but I, I have to be writing to to kind of get at those questions for myself, not thinking about what others might might come to when they come to the work. I hope they find something. I hope it illuminates something for them, but I hope it sparks their own questions too. All right, and I apologize to the questioner if I mispronounce this name, Adenike Phillips. Um, Maybe Adenike, only because Adenike. I know that brilliant poet. Hey, Adenike, okay. I hope that's you. Uh, it says, thank you so much for reading, sharing your work. Family history can be traumatic. What was the hardest for you to learn about your family and how did you deal with it? Oh, I mean, the 
quite frankly, uh, that's a great question, Ananike. Um, but the 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 things that were most difficult were right up front, right? Like just learning that my grandmother had been sent to the asylum. I mean, kind of learning some of the details of her stay. That was very difficult. Um, and then going back and reading, I had read uh, Minnie's WPA narrative um, because I'm a, a student of African American history and I had looked through those narratives before. I had no idea that she was connected to me as a, my great, great, great grandmother until many years after. So when I went back and it's it's cited in many places, like I, I told you, it's a very different narrative than some of the others. So it's cited many, many times in different kinds of, of, of anthologies, et cetera. Um, but it's a difficult narrative because she talks about her mother being raped and beaten. Um, she talks about, uh, you know, the way that um, the enslaved are, are kept from worshiping and are, are kept from, you know, faith practice and how difficult life is. So when I went back through to kind of read it and annotate it and think about it with a fine tooth comb, it was hard to, to imagine this in real time. And it was hard to imagine how they survived it. But I knew they did because I was here. So that was the gift of, of, of that difficulty. Yeah. Thank Good you very question. much. Um, mm -hmm. Our next, oh, she says, uh, he or she says, thank, or they says thank you as well um, mm -hmm. for that. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee, says, beautiful reading. Okay. The WPA uh, record, well-meaning, but is so skewed. Um, <laughs> how do you interpret the archive, especially the archives of people on the margins? And let me go ahead and read the next question also from the anonymous attendee i'm not sure if it's the same one or not but it seems connected sure. so many black and brown people don't have physical archives what else do you use to recreate their lives that we have addressed that i a think we've bit. answered yeah i think we've kind of answered some of that so you do some of that work and, and some of that family history and and you might not record people um, but you might write down have them talk to you and kind of write things down that's what i did because people didn't always want to be recorded so that's a way that i've kind of handled that and then back up to um, the question about the the WPA um, records being skewed. I mean, we we come to them with eyes wide open, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. I know the way that they read now. Um, that I, me reading them, a lot of that language is going to be coded. Um, and so I also look at the the interviews that you know were given a different kind of freedom, uh, like Minnie. You know, she's given a different kind of. Uh, psychic freedom, uh, she can tell a different story because she is in safe hands, right? Um, and so I think we understand that. And that's the, also the way that we frame them for students and for those coming to the work today um, to say, you know, this is how these were collected. Here are some of the issues and here are some things that you should look for. Also, here are some of the coded language that you might expect to see. And here are the differences between those that are, you know, really wonderful samples and those that you know, might not give us everything that, that we would like to from the time. Thank you. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. I okay. will, we've got two more questions. I don't think we can get them to both. Um, have you heard the term mother wound? You mentioned trauma as a unifying aspect of the personal archive. So many of us don't have the wonderful ancestors to draw on. Oh, that's a good question. I have not heard the term mother wound myself. Um, so I'll be, you know, heading off to look at it. Um, and really, because, you know, I, I want to learn everything I can. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, many, I, I recognize that this is, this is a good problem to have for me to be able to find these things. And also, you know, many of us just get stuck at a certain point in archival research anyway, because those records aren't there. Um, so, you know, I, I understand that this is a really kind of miraculous, and I say as much literally <laughs> in the book that, you know, I was able to find this information. Um, but, you know, the, you can you can lean on the personal as opposed to leaning on historical narrative, because I think there's so much there. I mean, that's what ends up happening in soul culture. I'm talking through my understanding of things. And a lot of that in soul culture, everything comes through my teachers, the people I read. None of those people are blood family. Um, so the way you come to understanding, you know, can be wide and varied. Oh, Bob, you're- Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm bad to do that. Um, thank you for an interesting discussion from one of our attendees. One, one last question, if you think you have time to answer it. Sure, I'll um, do it quickly. 
there are more poets than poetry readers considering yeah. the poetry book sales. You know, why is that? Why is reader attention so low? Oh, no, that's a whole nother um, <laughs> hour discussion. <laughs> but what a fantastic question. That's really true, of course. Um, and I think because one of the reasons, I mean, this is obviously very narrow and we have 30 seconds. So one of the reasons is poetry is just taught really badly. We start people from, you know, even in high school, we start people from the poets that they have absolutely no relationship to. We don't start them in the contemporary. We start them with, you know, and no offense to Whitman, I love him deeply, but oh, Captain, my captain means nothing to me. I mean, at least lead with, you know, I sing the body electric because that's brilliant, right? And not that oh, Captain, my captain isn't, but I don't see a personal connection. So if we start with the contemporary, um, in the way that many musicians have found the way to do plenty of people love hip hop and, and there's, you know, elements of poetry that are there. So it can be done. Um, but I think a lot of it just comes from us feeling like it's inaccessible because of the way it's taught. So we teach it better and people, people will love it more. Thank you so much. And, mm -hmm. uh, Boaz, I don't know if you are coming back to, to close us out or if we're just, just through, uh, wanted to say i always start with those winter sundays that's where hey come on hayden i love it yes i, I, I so think much. we're done i had a great experience and learned so much and thank you both for for doing this uh, with us it was really wonderful thank you thank you boaz for having us and thank you again heather appreciate you all thank you heather that was great yes and thank you so much for coming of course have a good day Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure. And thank you, Stephanie. Love your work. We'll see you in the chat.